Plenty of people, plenty of institutions, have the power to ruin childhoods. State schools? Public schools, the Catholic Church, certain organized religions I'm probably not allowed to mention because that's how equality works, government ministers, Jeffrey Epstein, pretty much anyone who worked for the BBC during the 1970s, orphanages, the adult entertainment industry, TikTok, countless young lives have been ruined by all these and many more. But the ability to ruin multiple generations of childhoods in the course of a mere 90 minutes belongs to a much more exclusive club of abusers, colloquially known as Hollywood. Several decades worth of childhoods were formatively influenced by Jurassic Park, and in Jurassic World it took Universal Studios just two hours to violate the lot of them. Several decades more grew up in a galaxy far, far away, yet it only took Ryan Johnson an extra 30 minutes to complete his abuse. The list, of course, is a depressingly long one. One of the broader definitions of genocide encompasses the intent to destroy a culture, and no industry has honed that skill with so much industrialized efficiency as Hollywood. It's a rare and terrible power, and no sane person would ever exercise it, which perhaps explains why the heads of the biggest studios seem so very insane. To paraphrase Douglas Adams, on no account should anybody capable of getting themselves made president of Lucasfilm be allowed to do the job. Very few multi-generational properties remain unmurdered by the psychopathic incompetence, but happy memories do have one or two last redoubts. By and large, these are cultural properties that have been shielded in whole or in part from Hollywood's rapacious urges, and amongst the biggest of these is that basket of kinder delights held by Nintendo, a company that can more than happily survive putting out substandard hardware because the software is so beloved and iconic. Mario, Zelda, Samus, Star Fox, Pokemon, Donkey Kong, and on and on and on it goes. From long before I was born to, at my current rate of alcohol consumption, long after my death, Nintendo, its consoles, and its properties have been cultural fixtures. Anyone who doesn't remember playing at least one great Nintendo game in at least one of the several generations of mainline and handheld consoles doesn't have a childhood to ruin. But there are no still points in a turning world, death and taxes notwithstanding, and the demands of progress have resulted in a concerted attempt to bring gaming mainstays into the domain of Hollywood. The Super Mario Bros. movie, now in theaters, is of course not the first such crossover, the last Mario movie was so bad, yes I am burning a lot of bridges in this video, that it pretty much ended Nintendo's brief experiment with multimedia at the time. But things are changing, they're ready to try again, and much more is on the line now than it was then. Because in Super Mario Bros., we're not just talking about the fate of a single movie. Far from it, in fact. Purely in the filmic realm, the success or failure of Mario potentially determines the fate of a putative cinematic universe. As the MCU fades, will the NCU rise? And if rise it does, the consequences could transcend cinema. Because we're staring at what looks distinctly like a broader battle of the studios here. Disney's travails in cinema and streaming are only a part of its broader malaise. The inability of its theme parks to rise from their COVID-induced coma, coupled with the company's ongoing battles with Ron DeSantis in Florida, have made the big beast look distinctly vulnerable. Some vultures do eat dead vultures, and Universal is a very formidable vulture indeed. The movie cynic and I recently started a little Monday night podcast, tentatively and modestly called the best show in the universe probably, and we were delighted to welcome the great Call Me Chato onto episode 3. I will let him explain the potential ramifications of a successful NCU launch. Well, there's, there's, there's more at stake with this movie. It has to hit a billion because there's a huge bet on it at Universal Studios. How much do they spend? I'm oh, not no, talking about the spend on the movie. I'm talking about its popularity to, um, to trigger the added uh, investments they're making at Universal Studio. Yeah. Uh, this is what Disney is most afraid of, is the expanded... They already have Nintendo, they already have Mario World at Universal, but oh, they're hoping that this supercharges it and, and expands it, and then Disney is, is shitting bricks. Oh, I didn't know that was at Universal. That makes a lot of yeah. sense. Yeah. So mm. this, this is part of a much bigger play that they need to make work. So when you're talking about it being conservative, uh, that's probably one of the reasons that it is. They, it, the, the stakes on this movie are huge. It goes beyond just making mm -hmm. your money back on the movie. So yes, there's quite a lot at stake, as I'm reasonably confident you'll agree. And that's fine. The greater the risk, the greater the potential reward, unless you're shagging someone with herpes, and the potential reward gets my inner child dancing around the room like he's found his aunt's special nose powder. Just imagine it, a Nintendo Cinematic Universe of the same caliber as Phase 1 of the MCU, Mario as Iron Man, a whole plethora of related genre pieces, 
fantasy with Zelda and Fire Emblem, sci-fi with Samus and Star Fox, something appropriately cute and surreal for Kirby, all culminating in an Avengers-style Smash Bros. crossover. In an ideal world, this would be superb. But we do not live in an ideal world, we live in this one, and this is the world where brilliant things go to die. I have described the best case scenario above. The mid-tier scenario is that Super Mario Bros. is appalling, and we'll have great fun tearing it apart in this video, and that will be the end of the matter. The worst case scenario is that it's so terrible that it tarnishes everything around it. The second worst case scenario, however, and by far the more probable one, is that the film is bad and successful, appealing to that vast audience blob that defends soulless garbage like Avatar, and nonsensically written entertainment experiences like John Wick 4, and provides the popularity and resource required to spawn an empty franchise into a world of empty franchises. Brainless fun, distractions for children that assume children are all idiots, debasing the wonderful potential of an idea by driving the lowest common denominator lower and lower and lower again. And there is so much great potential here. The reason properties like Mario and Zelda have been so well received and so long lasting, the reason Nintendo remains such a unique proposition, is that they implement innovative writing and narrative structures even in seemingly plot-free or plot-light platform games. The application of Kisho Tenketsu, a four-act conflict-free writing structure, both to story and to level design, is one of the underlying reasons Mario games, amongst many others, have that very distinctive feel. It's one of the reasons those games are not just any other generic platformer. The form is a counterpart to traditionally Western plans like the three-act structure in the hero's journey. The first act serves as introduction, the second as development, the third is a twist, and the fourth serves as conclusion. And I mention all of this not to flaunt my credentials as some terrible fucking writing nerd, but to demonstrate that the reason for Nintendo's success is that it has not typically fallen for the kind of thought-free, bland repetition that characterizes so much Western media these days. My permanent irritation with the turn your brain off and have fun brigade of fanboys is that this approach precludes the creation of great art, great stories, and great games. It does not invite more of them. That's not me demanding that a Mario movie demonstrate the same writing chops as Dostoevsky, in case anyone was thinking of trotting out that absurd argument again. Nor is it me demanding that a kid's movie matches The Godfather in tone or intent. It is me saying that you can, at the very least, have the respect for your craft to tell your best story in your best way, and the self-respect not to settle for a thought-free, content-empty rehash of a billion generic offerings on the grounds that, eh, it's just a kid's movie. Kids enjoyed Star Wars. Kids enjoyed Jurassic Park. Puss in Boots is more thoughtful and serious than Avatar The Way of Water. Who are you really insulting when you say you enjoyed a thing because you turned your brain off because it's just a kid's movie? If you're the kind of person who would say that, by the way, you're also probably simple, so I'll make it clear just in case you're insulting yourself, my dear. An audience doesn't have to be aware of the thought underlying the art they're consuming, but the quality of what you consume depends on the application of thought to its creation and on that being rewarded. It's fine to enjoy more generic offerings, everyone does, but if you acknowledge any difference in quality between The Legend of Zelda and any one of thousands of generic spin-offs, and if you want more of Zelda, then it pays to be discerning and to acknowledge the difference you recognize, and then to ask yourself, why is Zelda better than X, Y, or Z? So I'm going to say here and now that if the best that Super Mario Bros. gives us is mindless fun, I will criticize the film for that reason. That doesn't mean you can't enjoy it, that doesn't mean you can't like it or have fun with it, it doesn't even mean that I necessarily hate it, but it does mean that the film has fallen short of its own vast potential and thereby given you something that, while it might be enjoyable, is less enjoyable and ultimately less meaningful than it could have been. To be clear, because I want to preemptively counter as many deficient arguments as possible before they inevitably appear in my comment section anyway, it's also not enough to dismiss criticisms of any film based on the character of the critics. Already, I've seen people I like and respect make this mistake. Both Yellow Flash and some of the Geeks and Gamers set, to take two examples, have attempted to argue that the reason critic scores for this film are so low is that the film isn't, quote-unquote, woke enough for them. You can actually broaden that point and improve it, and I'm going to do that annoying thing and plug my podcast by clipping from it again. Uh, most of the reviewers in the cinema world don't play games. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, uh, good point. And, and it's... You know, it is very a game centric ver an animation, which I can see a lot of the critics not caring for at all compared to the politics that Pixar has gotten themselves into. So Pixar has always had a warm place, even in the Lasseter era, of being cinematic animation. So it felt like something that critics actually wanted to 
critique. This was part of their over of, of movies that they'd be willing to, uh, to review. Whereas I, I, this movie doesn't fit any of that. I, I can't see them out of the gate, especially looking forward to, we're looking forward to this movie compared to Lightyear. No, I mean, a huge number of, you know, well, hell, it's, it's almost a meme, isn't it? That media journalists are so bad at games, they've actually got their own difficulty setting in games now. They, you have a video, <laughs> they say the level below easy is for games journalists. Uh, <laughs> and both of these arguments are relevant to the discussion, but they are not determinative of a film's quality. Sometimes the woke get it right, even if for the wrong reasons. Sometimes even games journalists get it right. It's not enough to say, this film is good because people I don't like hate it. Because if you dismiss opinions based on the identity of those who hold them, you are doing exactly what you accuse them of doing. It might just be that the Mario film isn't that good. This isn't me shitting on Yellow Flash or Geeks and Gamers, this is me honestly disagreeing on an approach to media criticism. My starting trichotomy is A. A Super Mario Bros. movie can be just as iconic and innovative as the games that gave rise to it. B. It can be just another product of the sludge pipe that mildly and temporarily gives a sleeping audience the vague impression of superficial delight. Or C. It can be so uniformly bad that it does to Nintendo what Ryan Johnson did to Star Wars. And now it's time to find out which it is. Consider the above the longest spoiler warning in history. On to the review. It might be worth mentioning at the outset that nobody who deploys the it's for kids argument is actually a kid, and few of them have kids of their own. As if to substantiate that point, my theatre showing, at peak time on the day of release, had an average age of around 30. There actually weren't many kids in the room at all, and those that were, of course, did their best to ruin things for the rest of us by shouting and throwing food and needing the toilet every other minute. The cinema was packed, though, which isn't something you can say for many films at the moment. Super Mario Bros. kicks off with Bowser's floating fortress, a counterpoint of Philip Pullman's clouded mountain, assaulting a beautiful ice city, deploying its vast armies of Koopas against the city's defenders. For some reason, Wu-Tang Clan plays as the penguins walk out of the city to confront them, only the first example of the film trying to elevate itself to iconic status by pinching iconic songs from outside of its oeuvre. And there are plenty more to come. It's a tad disappointing, because it's not as if there aren't more iconic themes in Mario alone than this film could possibly make use of, and because it's such a transparent attempt to breed a kind of familiarity with the audience. This song's a banger. It's in this film, so this film's a banger, trust me. That's not unlike Taika Waititi's approach to music in Thor Love and Thunder. The film will go on to make good use of classic Nintendo motifs, but it will also reserve many of its key moments for bangers that are so overused that they defeat the purpose of deploying them. The penguins, of course, are a reference, and if the word reference seems overused by the end of this video, then I have pretty accurately depicted the film's over-reliance on references. References themselves are not a bad thing, of course, but ideally we would see these references put to a grander purpose rather than the grand purpose of the film being references. To put it another way, I'm all for the film refing the fact that you can murder baby penguins in Mario 64, and the film would be reduced by the absence of that reference. But if the only purpose of that reference is, hey, remember throwing the penguin kid off the cliff? Then what you've got is a member berry, and it will be genuinely fascinating to note how many people who otherwise know that member berries are a flaw in a film and not a benefit to it forget that knowledge in their assessment of Super Mario Brothers. The penguins don't put up much of a fight, Bowser destroys their castle in which he finds a power star, and then we yanked away to the real world where we get a Ghostbusters reference, a TV ad for Mario and Luigi's new plumbing business. The film is, rightly, not ashamed to date itself in this way, drawing clear inspiration from the decade its progenitor helped define, both in visual and musical references, though it doesn't do this consistently. This is not an 80s callback in its entirety, it's a modern film that occasionally wants to pay homage to its 80s roots, which approach essentially sums up its entire approach. It plays on memory selectively while telling a generic modern story, it doesn't attempt to make these callbacks diegetic, which is to say, it doesn't use them to build its world, it uses them because the audience outside of that world is familiar with them. The Mario Brothers ad is the film's opportunity to knowingly self-reference complaints about voices and accents. The TV ad does make the Mario Brothers sound familiar, oh, it's me, Mario, Luigi. but they won't sound familiar for the remainder of the runtime. What is this place? Luigi, are you in there? They had access to the existing voice actor for Mario, Charles Martinet, and we know this because he actually does voice a couple of the characters in the film. It's a perfect! In the first instance, a nameless old Italian chap who comments on our main character's accents. But Charles Martinet isn't as big a draw as Chris Pratt, so Chris Pratt is what we get, for Mario at least, 
And our first instance of one of Super Mario Bros. abiding faults, lack of vocal variety. Pratt's been criticized by plenty of hacks for all the wrong reasons, and defended by the anti-hack set for similarly wrong reasons. In the event, he gives an unmemorable performance, there's not much else to say about it, alongside the likes of Charlie Day, Seth Rogen, and Keegan-Michael Key, all of whom conspire to make their various characters sound pretty much exactly the same. We'll come onto this later, with the introduction of Donkey Kong and the rest of the Kongs, but I'll tee it up in broad terms now by saying that making several very distinct voices sound exactly alike is a fault of writing first, then of direction, and then of acting, but more on that in due course. Mario and Luigi have recently left a larger plumbing business to form their own company, and the film teases an antagonistic relationship with their former boss, whose name is Spike. My immediate thought upon seeing this was, hmm, I wonder if they'll set Spike up as the dramatic parallel to Bowser. And that is indeed what the film begins to do, establishing the Mario Brothers generally and Mario specifically as plucky underdogs. But then it proceeds to ditch Spike entirely until a remarkably brief cameo at the end, which plays no role in the narrative whatsoever. Evidence, and there will be more, that good ideas were presented in the writer's room, but nobody ever really felt it worthwhile following them through. The Mario Brothers get their first job for their new business and set off to pursue it, only for their van to break down, which forces them to go on foot. This affords the film a chance to do the first of many references to platform games, and at this stage it's a useful reference, because it serves a narrative and a dramatic purpose. It shows our protagonist's skills, which will become relevant later on. It's been to the film's credit thus far that it assumes a fairly strong degree of familiarity with its origins, and so it's eschewed the temptation to indulge in extensive origin stories. This is an origin story, of course, but it's not an origin story from square one. The writers assume correctly that the audience knows who Bowser is in vague terms, and indeed who Mario and Luigi are, at least in broad terms, and it will continue to make these assumptions. Nominally, this would free the writers to create narrative introductions but not character introductions, essentially establishing where known entities fit in this cinematic universe and not who those characters are generally. See for comparison the introduction of Tom Holland's Spider-Man into the MCU, which eschewed the repetitive origin story that everyone by now is far too familiar with. The problem, though, which is already apparent and which will only become more apparent later, is that the safe assumption that the audience doesn't need much of an introduction to the characters has bred a laziness on the part of the writers, a laziness that enables them to rely on tropes and brand familiarity at the expense of story. Essentially, and to preempt pretty much everything that follows, this film depicts known commodities rather than seeking to tell new stories with known commodities. The comparator is inevitably with the MCU. Iron Man did not lazily lean on its comics origins at the expense of its story. It took that known commodity and it played his origin, ensuring that a general audience as well as existing fans could invest in the start of a journey. Super Mario Bros. by contrast is what Iron Man would have been had its creators assumed that everyone had read the comics and all they wanted was to see familiar things on the screen, but more on that later. The Mario Bros. first job for these new customers doesn't exactly go to plan and they fall foul of the family dog. In the course of fighting it, they end up flooding the entire bathroom, leading them to return somewhat dejected to the family home for a family meal, where Mario Sr. criticizes Mario Jr. not only for leaving a steady job, but for dragging Luigi down with him. This isn't characterization yet, but it is a very good premise for characterization. It establishes attachment and guilt and the weight of expectation, casting Mario as the protective older brother, whose successes, and more pertinently his failures, are especially pronounced for their impact on others. There are two clear paths from this beginning. The first is a more complicated and expensive, from the writer's perspective, character journey in which the dynamic relationship plays out gradually over the course of the film. Joint adventures with ever greater risks, a significant failure with its core consequence being the loss of Luigi, either physically or psychologically, a coda in which Mario suffers for dwelling on his mistakes, and the subsequent redemption arc in which Luigi is regained thanks to Mario's moral growth and development. For stalling anyone who's about to chastise me. For expecting complex character work in a kid's movie, A, this actually isn't very complex at all, and B, it happens all the goddamn time in kids' movies. Sully and Mike go through a similar experience in Monsters, Inc., as do Shrek, Fiona, and Donkey in Shrek. Han Solo's departure and his heroic return in A New Hope is a variant of this trope. TV Tropes itself calls it plot-mandated friendship failure, and it's a common trope precisely because it very neatly conveys character conflict that pays off all the work done prior to its deployment. The second road Super Mario Bros. could take from the aforementioned premise is, from the writer's perspective, easy and inexpensive. A single event manufactures the loss of the Ouija, and the rest of the film is kind of a quest to get him back. This is easier and less expensive because it essentially writes one character out of the script entirely, while minimizing the amount of character building Mario requires in order to rectify his mistake. Ah, but I hear you say, Platoon, surely they won't do that? 
Mario rescues Peach, not Luigi. That's always how it works. To which I respond, oh, my sweet summer child, this is 2023. There's absolutely no fucking way Mario is going to rescue Peach. Anyway, I've probably spent longer on this scene than the movie does, because it very rarely does character work of any kind and absolutely refuses to linger on it. So the family dinner scene lasts about a minute before things move on. Mario and Luigi see a convenient news report on TV about a terrible flood afflicting Brooklyn, and Mario takes this as their chance to prove themselves by saving the city. So off they go, in another platform game reference, into the sewers. Their bid to fix the problem goes awry, and they get blasted through a wall into a secret section of the sewers, where they find an iconic green pipe. The pipe sucks them out of this dimension and into game world through some reasonably creative visual work. The animation throughout is never less than solid, and it does occasionally apply imagination rather than lifting directly from the games. The sky between the pipe sequence is one of these, a kind of interdimension that acts as a nexus, various pipes leading off to various different realms of the game world. Mario and Luigi tumble through the not Bifrost, and the film deploys their one substantive character dynamic. Nothing can harm us as long as we're together, Mario intones, which naturally means they're immediately torn apart and sucked through into different tunnels. It's not especially clear from the delivery, because the delivery in this film is often indistinguishable from AI voice mimicry, whether this is intended to be funny. One gets the sense it was intended to be funny, but this film does visual comedy much better than verbal, which it tends to telegraph so far in advance that you've already played the punchline in your head by the time it actually arrives. But it's also a little bit muddled, since nothing can harm us so long as we're together also serves as a sincere message later on. Part of the problem with having a plot and characters as shallow as these, the film's style is bumper sticker prose, is that there isn't enough substance to tell an ongoing joke, hence its preference for visual gags. While the plot and its messaging are so lightweight, they can easily be repurposed for jokes at any given moment, making it unsafe to assume any given scene is supposed to be sincere. It's a problem endemic to modern media, and really pioneered by the MCU. It's also not the only problem Super Mario Bros. has in common with that benighted franchise, and so it will be interesting to note how many people who criticize Marvel for this style of humor forgive the same in Mario. Mario lands in a forest of mushrooms, which the film has decided he hates, and where he meets Toad, one of a great many Toads in this film, but the only one of any kind of character relevance, so we'll refer to him as Toad Prime going forward. Toad Prime explains, that while Mario has landed in Mushroom Kingdom, Luigi has gone to one of the many realms of hell currently under Bowser's control. Toad Prime decides the only thing for it is to go and see the princess, so off we go. And no, I'm not abridging this at all. The film doesn't really have any connecting tissue. It just hurtles from set piece to set piece, like Mario if his vice was speed rather than mushrooms. Luigi, meanwhile, is in a dark and creepy place, which, as with pretty much everything else in the film, is a chance for a game reference, this time to Luigi's Mansion. Anyone who hoped that this germinal Nintendo cinematic universe might turn references into premises, potentially giving us a Luigi's Mansion-inspired horror light film further down the line, or some F1 or NASCAR-inspired Mario Kart team-up, or a gradual multi-film lead-in to a climactic battle with Bowser, or an Avengers-style Smash Brothers event bringing various arcs together, well, anyone who thought that will probably need to check their expectations a bit. It's not impossible that further Nintendo films will develop an equivalent structure, but Super Mario Bros. reference addiction is already burning through a lot of potential, and it would have wasted about five films worth of potential storylines by the close. Luigi encounters and then gets chased by a horde of reanimating dry bones, which acts loosely as a scene-setting set piece. The film is really just a succession of PC high-octane set pieces acting as reference galleries, so we jump away from Luigi's race through hell, which culminates in his capture, to Mario's equivalent race through heaven, as Toad guides him through the streets of the Mushroom Kingdom. All of this is designed for viewers to scan the screen looking for recognizable game assets, which can be fun, sure, but it's also meant to be a film, not Pokemon Snap. It's lovely to see all of this, of course. It's nice that they've stuck very closely to the design of Princess Peach's castle from the N64 era, but ideally these are settings for a story. They're not a point in and of themselves. Dungeons & Dragons had a similar problem, throwing a bunch of references onto the screen and name-calling a lot without giving many of these things a character or a purpose beyond member berries. And it did this while telling what was the most depressingly safe and unambitious story imaginable, until Mario came out a week later and played it even safer. Upon reaching the castle, Toad guards tried to stop Mario from entering, so Toad Prime distracts them by cooking for them, which I guess is supposed to be funny, allowing Mario to sneak inside. Princess Peach is holding a war council, allowing the film to establish Bowser's ticking clock threat to Mushroom Kingdom and to give us our next quest, which we'll pursue once it's finished its obligatory two-minute max connecting scene. Mario meets Peach, who makes fun of his height. The film continues to view character work as its enemy, and so she pretty well immediately promises she'll help him get Luigi back, so long as he first shows her what he's capable of. 
meaning, again, that the film is looking to manufacture the quickest of pretexts for another reference gallery. This one takes the form of an obstacle course that looks, to absolutely no one's surprise whatsoever, like a platform game. Peach exposits the power-up dynamic, get the boxes to get the mushrooms to get the powers, just like the games, get hit and lose the powers, just like the games, and Mario attempts to jump the platforms, just like the games. Unlike the games, Bonnie Tyler's Holding Out for a Hero plays during what really amounts to another montage of references. I've moaned about this already. Not least because it's actually quite a cynical ploy, but it's also worth moaning about it additionally because the film's original score genuinely isn't terrible and implements various familiar motifs from the games without lapsing into an over-reliance on derivation. In other words, the score's approach to its source material is a much better mix of the new and the original, and demonstrates a greater ability to put references to innovative uses than the film it's attached to. Were the soundtrack written with the same lack of imagination as the film, it would have been a simple medley of established motifs, compiled rather than composed for the film. You can turn your brain off entirely for these various montage set pieces, and the film probably hopes that you do. It's banking on the novelty value of games on screen not wearing off over its 90-minute runtime. Whether it does, of course, depends on you. My sense of the audience of which I was a part was that it was wearing off steadily throughout, and so what at the beginning got the occasional laughs or exclamations of familiarity gradually diminished, in part because of that familiarity. After all, there's only so long you can play, hey, you've seen this before, before the audience begins to think, well, yeah, I I've seen this all before. Mario ultimately fails in his bid to complete the course, but Peach says he's done well enough. Not as well as her, of course. She did much better, completed it on her first go, etc. But we've established that Mario isn't a quitter. Combined with his vague attachment to Luigi, that is the extent of his character and no further work will be done. So we cut away to Bowser, who really does seem strikingly like Satan from South Park. Just supplant his falling over Peach with Satan's falling over Saddam, and you could pretty much swap these characters without doing too much damage to the plot, if indeed you do any damage to it at all. Bowser informs his gathered armies that his plan is to marry Peach, which disappoints his legions, but if she rejects him, he'll destroy the Mushroom Kingdom, which pleases his legions. The film then isn't so much trying to add a story to the game's premise as it's relying on meta-humor to explain away these apparent absurdities. One of the first questions to ask of the film was how it would treat with the absence of a substantive plot from its source material. And the absence was an opportunity as well as a worry. It was an opportunity because the film had considerable leeway to create a story within this world, with the essential beats having been established by its source material and the freedom to knit these together as the writers pleased. It was a worry because asking well-paid screenwriters to, you know, actually write stuff these days is to demand far too much of them, and the alternative approach was always going to be, let's just make jokes about the lack of plot in this film and not actually add anything beyond manufacturing pretexts to get references on the screen. That approach was by far the cheapest, and I very much fear the audience will settle for it, and so that's what the writers have done. Meaning I have to re-emphasize, you can enjoy all of this if you want to, but if given a choice between a fun plot-free caper with familiar settings and characters, and a fun caper with familiar settings and characters and a great story, which would you enjoy more? Peach and Mario set off on their adventure and are joined by Toad Prime, who Peach praises for demonstrating a quality apparently not found among the Toad stalls in general, courage. Don't worry though, that's the extent of his character work as well. We're not going to get bogged down by actually doing anything with it, meaning we can immediately switch our brains off again for another travel montage through a reference gallery. Meanwhile, Bowser remembers he's voiced by Jack Black, which more or less guarantees he'll have a few musical numbers in the film. We get his first one, yet again making Bowser seem a bit like a South Park villain. Not so much I'm Ronry as I'm horny. He's interrupted by a wizardly magic Cooper who informs him that Mario is with Peach, which makes Bowser paranoid and jealous. Speaking of, the film has given Mario and Bowser their allotted 30 seconds worth of character development, so now it's Peach's turn. She notices that Mario seems a bit downcast and reiterates her promise to save Luigi. Though why she should have come so quickly to value this proposition is and will always be a mystery. The film has established that her kingdom faces an imminent and existential threat, which you'd think might make Luigi somewhat less important in her mind. That she should have so quickly shacked up with Mario is likewise incongruous, and the film is hither to excuse this with a nudge and a wink to show it's aware of the nonsense. Peach uses her 30 seconds to explain that her background is a mystery. She, like Mario, is a human, but she doesn't know why or how she ended up in the Mushroom Kingdom. And if the film were actually bothered about character work, it would use this as the key for her quick attachment to Mario and Luigi. And it almost does do this, but only in this scene and without clearly establishing anything between them, and it will proceed to do nothing else with it for the remainder of the runtime. Shy Guys then bring Luigi before Bowser, who tortures him by pulling his moustache, which is mildly amusing, but the film does seem to think it's much funnier than it actually is. 
Eventually, this compels Luigi to divulge info on Mario before he's imprisoned in a cage suspended above lava next to a load of other cages full of captured references, including a Luma, the blue starlight creature that's played as both childlike and comically nihilistic. There's gotta be a way out of here. The only hope is the sweet release of death. Whoa! Oh, you've got to be kidding me! It is entertaining, though slightly overused, and if you want an exact replica of the character, look up the tiny goth kid in South Park. Nobody stopping Cthulhu now. All will be sadness. Life will become death. And I will watch the crimson blood leak from your neck. They even sound exactly the same. After another reference gallery travel sequence, this one being our first imbibing of the Mario Kart member berries, and accompanied by Aha's take on me because it's popular or something, I don't know, Mario and Peach and Toad arrive in the Kong Kingdom. They are then brought before Cranky Kong. Cranky Kong, as the name might suggest, is usually, well, cranky. He's a cranky old guy. There's a whole comedic archetype around the cranky old guy. It's a character trope with great utility. Pretty easy laughs from cranky old men. But because Cranky Old Men is a character archetype, and Super Mario Bros. doesn't do character pretty much at all, they take the Cranky out of Cranky Kong. He has the same slightly zany, slightly meta, flippant and unserious style of humor as pretty much everyone else in the film. He even sounds a lot like pretty much everyone else in the film. You could take any of his lines and put them in anyone else's mouth, and it wouldn't sound out of place or out of character. I know there'll be plenty of people who are content with, hey look, it's Cranky Kong! But if your movie does less character work with him than Donkey Kong Country on the snares, is it really Cranky Kong, or does it just look like him? And my god, the longer I spend on this film, the hollower it begins to feel. You don't even have to say it's no fun to understand that it could have been so much more fun had the writers put in even a teeny tiny little bit of work. Cranky Kong uncrankily refuses to bend the knee to Peach unless Mario can fight and beat Donkey Kong, his son. Not that the father-son dynamic has much relevance at all to the story, though the film will later try and pretend that it does. And this is the quick, perfunctory preamble to our first Super Smash Bros. reference, which is at least slightly redeemed because rather than playing some iconic pop song, it uses the DK rap. Though this just reinvites the question, if you've got all of this musical material to draw from, why the crippling fuck did you choose Aha? This also constitutes a missed opportunity, because Mario and Donkey Kong are the OG enemies of the Nintendoverse. Mario's first appearance was in a Donkey Kong game, after all. Donkey Kong could have been the enemy in this film. You could draw on King Kong for inspiration. Hell, you could draw on Batman v Superman for inspiration. Imagine a film with a tenth of the references that told ten times more story that culminated in a showdown between Mario and Donkey Kong. You introduce these two characters, you spend much more time fleshing them out and fleshing out their rivalry, and you save much of the rest for later. Close the film with Bowser taking Thanos' place in a post credit scene setting up the wider Nintendo Cinematic Universe. This is what I mean when I say that Super Mario Bros. is burning through several films worth of material with shallow depictions of familiar places and people that could have warranted their own films. If this is the beginning of an NCU, it more closely mirrors the faults of DC's expanded universe than it does the merits of early stage Marvel. DC attempted to skip over a decade of build-up to catch its rival, and as a result it gave us awful scripts with hollow characters mashed together out of a sense of obligation. Much as defenders of this film have forgotten that Member Berries is supposed to be a criticism, rushing your build-up and burning through your source material, sacrificing its huge potential, is something everyone knows to be a fault with DC. Is it too much to ask that people apply their standards consistently? Yes, of course it fucking is. But nah. Instead of using the Avengers as a model for a Smash Brothers crossover event with properly established characters, or hell, instead of using Smash Brothers itself as a model for creating crossover stories, Mario vs. DK is relegated to another reference gallery set piece among endless reference gallery set pieces and largely devoid of stakes or of consequence. DK beats the shit out of Mario for a bit until Mario gets a power-up that turns him into a cat with the attendant claws and reflexes and this allows him to win. Yay! You're much much more invested when you do a 1v1 fight with a level 9 DK in Smash Bros. Melee. Set piece over, the film wastes no time in setting up the next one. Not Very Cranky Kong informs us that Bowser will arrive in the Mushroom Kingdom by sundown, meaning that they need to take a shortcut to beat him there. Apparently this constitutes plot writing, so they all hop into carts for the next big set piece, a Mario Kart reference gallery replete with banana throwing and Rainbow Road, accompanied on this occasion by ACDC's Thunderstruck because I guess Highway to Hell was too expensive. And yes, it does look lovely. The member berries are deployed exquisitely. They taste beautiful. It reminds me that I've had great fun playing Mario Kart in the past, and it lets me enjoy those memories while the film moves along in the background. Back with Bowser, he's rehearsing his proposal speech, which is interrupted as he learns about the kart plan. 
The film isn't concerned with setting out how they keep getting this intel, because once again that would require something approaching a plot. Instead, Bowser learns important information when it's important to the film that he learns this information, in order that he can importantly carry out his next action, which in this case is an ambush with his own carts of the war party on Rainbow Road. This gives us a Rainbow Road chase sequence that of course looks lovely and shows the film's comparatively superior faculty for visual as opposed to verbal humor, as Bowser's henchmen deploy the tried and tested blue shell, which duly ruins the lives of people who actually deserve to win the game. We even get nice little references like L button drifting and boosting, as well as a selection of familiar Mario Kart weapons, before the blue shell does indeed ruin things for the leaders, knocking DK and Mario off the track and into the sea where they get swallowed by an eel. Peach and Toad, meanwhile, make it back to Mushroom Kingdom and tell everyone to evacuate, they having lost both Mario and the DK army on the road. And look, look, I know, I know I'm going to be considered a miserable killjoy who hates fun, but if we are going to treat this as a film and not just one big montage for game fans, why? If Bowser really wants to get to Peach, and if Mushroom Kingdom is entirely undefended, why didn't he just come here straight away? Why did he need to go around enslaving people and destroying other kingdoms in search of a power star first? Bowser's stated reasoning seems to be that he wanted the Power Star as leverage to persuade Peach to accept his proposal, but we've already established that she's just as likely to say no, and we've not established that she has any knowledge of or desire for the Power Star anyway, and her refusal would result in the destruction of her kingdom anyway, which ought to provide all the leverage that Bowser needs, or at least as much as he could possibly attain. The answer to all this, of course, is because the script needed it to happen. But would it have been too much to add an intervening step establishing his inability to reach the Mushroom Kingdom without the Power Star? Some magical bullshit barrier that it allows him to pass, or some power it confers that lets him wipe out the kingdom's defenses? Hell, the power conferred by the star doesn't even get mentioned until the close of the film, meaning we've missed the chance to truly establish it as a useful MacGuffin, say by seeing it imbue Bowser with new powers that make him truly formidable. I'm not advocating for a one-to-one -one transposition, but compare it with the way the MCU introduces Infinity Stones, first as tools conferring significant power, and only later as a universal MacGuffin of much broader significance. But that is because the MCU tried to tell stories with its characters, while this film just wants us to say, oh look, it's a power star, remember the power star? I remember the power star, and look, I've, I've heard a lot from, and I'm already tired by people who say that the film is unashamedly pro-gamer. Well. Fine, but the MCU was unashamedly pro-comics in its early days, and it still managed to tell stories that appealed to a general audience, because simply giving gamers what they remember playing in games is not how you create a cinematic franchise, it's not how you transpose them into a narrative medium. It's not enough to say, well the film shows fidelity to the games. That's a necessary condition, sure, it's not a sufficient one. What are you doing with this fidelity? What's the point of any of it? Why should we be invested in this film, rather than simply playing the games it's referencing? In the eel's belly, DK gets his allotted 30 seconds of character work. His dad thinks he's an embarrassment, he says, even though we've never seen that and it's not actually relevant to anything at all. Mario sympathizes, because his dad thinks the same thing, but in case you thought we might really achieve anything with this, besides him saying, yeah, same, something like, I don't know, relationship forming or character development? Nah, they spot a rocket engine attached to an old cart, which they use to fly out of the eel's mouth and toward the next big set piece in a reference gallery. This reference gallery set piece is occasioned by the wedding, the audience of which is one huge reference gallery. Look, there's King bob -um. Imagine if he'd been an actual villain in the first film that Mario has to overcome before we moved on to bigger and better things. That might have been fun, but nah, oh well I guess. Bowser intends to ritually sacrifice all his prisoners as the backdrop to the wedding because, you know, he's evil. Naturally, it's Luigi in the cage and not Peach because the year is 2023. They get lowered toward the lava as Bowser gives his proposal speech, but Peach unsurprisingly rejects him, and so begins our second Smash Brothers reference, Peach vs. Bowser, shortly joined by DK and Mario on their rocket. They first have to platform their way up to join the fight proper, while fending off references by picking up references to throw at references to beat references, while Peach wields references to attack references in her ongoing battle with Bowser and his army of references. All the while, the prisoners slowly descend toward the lava, only to be rescued at the last minute by DK, while Mario in a squirrel suit rescues Luigi and whisks him away like he's Peach. Bowser, who Peach froze with a reference, breaks out of the ice and launches a big old bullet bill reference to destroy Mushroom Kingdom. What follows is almost certainly a nod to Tony Stark saving New York from the nuke as Mario intervenes in his suit to lead it away, though he accomplishes this instead by pissing off the bullet bill and being chased by it. He tricks it into a convenient green pipe, only for it to explode in the sky between the pipe's realm, which causes some sort of implosion that begins to suck everyone and everything into it. Mario gets sucked back to Brooklyn, followed in short order by Bowser and his doom ship because that's what the plot demands happen. 
The Power Star falls off the Doom Ship, and they have another fight that essentially just mirrors the fight with DK from earlier. Bowser beating the shit out of Mario. He knocks him into a shop where he's dazed, he proceeds to hide behind a counter for a bit. Gee, I wonder if he'll rediscover his courage because he never quits like we were told he never quit earlier. Peach, DK, and Toad turn up, three level 2s against one level 8, and buy Mario enough time to realize that pretty much the entirety of his character can be condensed into you never quit, so he duly never quits, and steps out of the shop to take on Bowser again. I suppose this is called character payoffs? Peach knocks the Power Star out of Bowser's hand because he didn't bother to use it for reasons. There's a brief chase as Mario runs for it. Bowser shoots fire at him, but Luigi saves him with a manhole cover. And Mario and Luigi can't lose when they're together. And you'll remember that the film told us this once, so that's, that's basically their entire relationship. So they both get the star and proceed to turn invincible and superpowered, and they beat the shit out of Bowser. It's worth noting, by the way, that for all our main characters have had very little writing work done for them, Luigi has had pretty much none at all. He just is. This is what happens when you accept that the games contain little by way of plot and so you, a screenwriter, shouldn't be expected to add any. They accepted a trade-off from the start. While conventionally it's Peach who's been kidnapped and so spends all of her time out of the script, this is, as aforementioned, 2023, and she really does then need to remain in the script and have agency and be a bit of a girl boss and so have a character, or what passes for a character by this film's standards. So Luigi has to take the place traditionally allotted to her, so he remains out of the script, and thus without having any character or personality made for him. Of course, if you as the writer felt for some bizarre reason obligated to do your job, you'd realize that being captured is no impediment to character work. Princess Leia's capture, both on the Tantive IV and her imprisonment on the Death Star, is used in that film to convey her character and personality. Even Dungeons & Dragons uses imprisonment as the basis to establish Discount Kirk and Michelle Rodriguez's characters, and that film went out of its way to be as safe and unimaginative as possible with its story and characters. But besides the brief moustache torture scene from earlier, which doesn't establish Luigi's personality at all because it's only there to prompt Bowser's subsequent actions, this is the first time we've seen him. The payoff, then, isn't to character work established throughout the film, but rather to a single line mentioned way back at the start. That it is a payoff technically is, well, something, I guess? But I keep going back to this point about missed potential. The film is incredibly formulaic, and it has formulaic payoffs. Had it bothered to give us character and story, the payoff would have meant so much more, as with everything else. But it didn't do any of that. But hey, I guess it did give us loads of video game references, so I can already tell my comment section is going to be full of people who accuse me of just hating fun. Mario and Luigi beat Bowser, Peach shrinks Bowser with a blue mushroom and they imprison him in a bottle, everyone hugs, the Super Mario Brothers are celebrated, Mr. Blue Sky plays because of course it does, and that's the end of the film. There are a couple of post credit scenes to speak of. A good chunk of my theatre, probably more than half of it, missed the first one because they'd already left. They didn't miss anything because it's just another chance for Jack Black to be Jack Black, serenading us as Bowser from within his miniature prison cage. Almost all of the theater missed the second and potentially the more consequential of the two post credit scenes. I'm also fairly sure that this is a Godzilla 1998 reference. At least it is strikingly similar. At the close of that film, the camera pans through the ruins of Madison Square Garden, the scene of an earlier battle. Eventually, it alights upon a Godzilla egg, which cracks, and a baby Godzilla breaks out of it and roars. While in Super Mario Bros., the camera pans through the ruins of the sewers, below the scene of an earlier battle. Eventually, it alights upon a Yoshi egg, which cracks, and we hear Yoshi, well, he doesn't roar, does he, but he does say his name, which has the unusual distinction of being sequel bait that, at least if my theater was any guy, didn't bait anyone save me and three other people who stayed to the end. And I do wonder whether that says something about the film itself. Lazy fun and a series of cheerful references might be superficially enjoyable, but they don't invite anyone to stay and see where it might go next any more than when you scoff at McDonald's, you spend time contemplating the various tastes and textures and wondering what you might order next time. And that really does sum up the film. It's fast food. It's enjoyable, to be sure, but the calories are pretty empty. It fills a hole. It doesn't invite questions or thoughts or much by way of artistic appreciation. You get all the Happy Meal toys, but those toys are all references to something else, something other than themselves. They're not popular because of the meal you just ate, they're popular because they belong to other and better properties that you remember having fun with before in a different time and place. And it must be said again, this is a really great shame. I'm fine with you enjoying Super Mario Brothers. I'm happy for you if you had fun with it. There was stuff to enjoy. It could be good fun. But it also could have been so much more than that. If it had even the semblance of a story, as opposed to a begrudging stand-in for one. 
If it did even a little bit of character work, rather than lazily assuming we already knew who everyone was. If it had any sense that it should be building towards something, rather than being the lazy culmination of decades of prior work, well, it could have been exceptional. It really could have been the basis on which a Nintendo Cinematic Universe was built, something with at least equivalent cultural memory and attachment done justice by the modern day. It could have replaced the MCU. It could have eclipsed the MCU. And God knows we're waiting for something to do that. But instead, if anything, it replicates many of its competitors' worst features. It's flashy and fast-paced and full of pop culture references and zany meta humor, but it has no story to speak of, nothing to invest in or to look forward to, no real stakes. If its plot seems to make more sense than, say, Ant-Man and the Bee in the Quantum of Sadness or Doctor Strange in his multiplex of ninjas, that's only because it has less plot than those things do, so less can go wrong. It's a laughably content-free affair that is not designed to be appreciated for the story it's telling, but rather to douse you in the memberberry equivalent of Bukaki. It sacrificed several years' worth of film and story potential because it didn't see the potential and didn't care about those stories. It capitalizes on the startling innovation of Nintendo while showing not one ounce of the same creative spark that gave rise to it. The Mario games aren't going to get old. They're going to continue creating memories, but I'd be surprised if anyone remembered this film by Christmas. And that is disappointing. It's fun, I guess, enjoyable if you insist, but really, given what it could be, it's really, really, really quite disappointing. But hey, it had lots of references, so hooray for cinema!